just to summarize, it's wealth and social security. We're looking at questions of social progress and equality trends, wealth sharing and tax justice, social security and poverty and social exclusion. Our first presenter is Professor Danny Dawling. All of you will know Danny. Uh, his biopic here is, uh, it will take too long, but look, basically, in his own words, he's tried to counter the potentially myopic view of the world, having lived in England most of his life. <laughs> uh, he started working with a group of researchers on a project to remap the world to show who has most and who has least. Um, and most of you will have read his works around this. And he's addressed housing, health, employment, education, poverty, published more than a dozen books on social inequalities, on housing, health, and all these subjects themselves. And he's actually, for many of us, he's been at the heart of the way in which a social geographer can influence the political agenda and really creatively come at an analysis in a way that, that others haven't. So, uh, Danny. Uh, thank you very much. It's very generous. Um, I won't read through this first slide. It's there for those who'd like to read, but I can recommend uh, Body Satnav for somebody to follow on Twitter. What Body Satnav does is produce very authentic quotes that you are so sure when you read them that a government minister has said that somebody like me watches the entire hour-long Sky interview with Jeremy Hunt to try to check it and finds out it isn't actually true, but then is shocked by what Jeremy actually says about his... Uh, high-tech company that he formed and, and various things. Instead, I'm going to tell you a story that's a happy a story of progress, something the government did which was very good. February 2021, government introduced a special payment for families with children. If you had a child aged six or under and you were on any form of benefit, which often meant you were working as well, you would get an extra £10 a week because the government recognised that there was a problem with the cost of living just beginning to go up in the crisis and they wanted to try and do something about child poverty. That government then instigated a meeting every week in its COBRA committee rooms because of the cost of living crisis and it looked at things like rent and the soaring costs and what it could do to control that. And then in November, the government changed that policy which it had introduced so that instead of just applying to children under six, it applied to children from 16 and below. So, and they increased the amount of money to £25 a week for each child. That's £100 a week for each child. If you've got three children and almost the majority of families with three children are in poverty, if you've got three children, that's an extra £300 a month the government were giving you, on top of all other things. Incredible. Don't believe that governments can't do things. Of course, this wasn't the government in Westminster. This was a government in a very far, far away country that we could never think to emulate. It was the government in Scotland that has done this. And you won't see it reported in the English press. £300 a month more money if you have three children and are living on benefit. You won't see it reported at all. Or another story of government. The government that saw as the crisis was getting worse that it needed to tax the rich and introduced a solidarity tax on the 23,000 richest families and then increased that wealth tax. Which incredibly progressive European country was that? Was it Finland? Was it Norway? Was it Sweden? No, it was Spain that did that. There is no need to be pessimistic about what governments can do. You are just led by people like this and they are, for various interesting historical reg regions, exceptionally misguided. Let's zoom through some slides. You'll know these things, but it helps to be reminded. We zoomed up from being in the 1970s the second most equitable country, large country in Europe after Sweden, to becoming the most unequal. But we reached that limit in the late or mid 1990s. We've been hovering at a plateau of inequality 
Those little blips, blips ups and down are random. In not one single year after the late 1990s did inequality actually fall. We've been living that for an entire generation. If you compare this to other countries, here's Canada, Germany and Finland, you can see how weird we are. If I was less lazy and updated my slides by a couple of years, you'd see that those other countries are all becoming more equal, as most of the OECD is becoming more equal at the moment, but not us. There are all kinds of implications of living with the highest rate of inequality in Europe, as we probably are now. It was about 2009, crowning glory of new labour. 2009, we overtook Portugal to become the most unequal country in Western Europe. 2013, I think we got to be just below Bulgaria. Uh, Stephanie Flanders, last week on telly, recounting how the poorest fifth of people in Britain are now worse off than the poorest fifth in most of Eastern Europe. Uh, I often like to think about myself as part of the um, left-wing economic establishment that Liz Truss <laughs> identified. And uh, I think there's something in it. I think there's a mood, mood change going on. But so much goes wrong when you are so incredibly unequal. These are jobs in the public sector. Falling over time since 1992 as a share of total employment. So you have this pared back, increasingly night watchman state that occurs. This is public spe sector spending, which goes up at the same time as public sector employees go down. And I could spend half an hour with this, but I will not, because I'm determined to keep the time so you get to hear about real people and not graphs from Imogen. But there's the 1980s for those of us old enough in the room. I think it's a majority still. You know, that's Margaret Thatcher, those cuts. They were bad. John Major, he wasn't all bad. A little bit of a rise. Uh, Labour come in 1997 with a promise to stay with Conservative spending plans for two years just so you always knew where you were. Um, they increased spending a bit, some double glazing, a few other things. Not much, I can argue it. Tipped some children over the poverty line, just paid for a war. That's partly why the spending goes up at the start of the millennium. Uh, and then you get 2008, and that great big rise for the banking crash. We had to bail out the banks. Then you get the austerity, that we've heard about. Then you get that huge rise, that's COVID. Happens everywhere. Uh, it's just that we weren't that efficient in where we were sending the money. Uh, and then you get, the great thing about these IMF figures is that governments tell the IMF what they're planning to do in future. So that's where we are now, we're on that downward trend. How do we compare? Here's the other four large countries in Europe, France, Germany, Italy and Spain. These are huge and enormous differences. These are, you know, there are, John Lanchester called it, there are many capitalisms. These are enormous. You're looking at multiples of entire national health spendings between what France does and what we do. We underestimate just how different these countries are and how weird we are. Apart from Malta, no other country in Europe makes its kids wear school uniforms. No other country has a private school sector like ours. I can go on and on and on. Here's the rest of Europe, not including Ireland and Switzerland for any pedants, but I have no time to explain why. But, you know, we're the outlier. We really are. People often accuse me of, of talking about British exceptionalism. But right? there's a problem. If you actually are exceptional, you know, it's hard. But let's go back. If you come nearer to me, you can see there's two coloured lines, a dash blue one and an orange one. Actually, governments have spent less than we did in the past. Greece just after the generals and Spain just after Franco was in power. That's what we compare to. And you'll know this is the £11,000 gap between what people might have expected on average to be living on and what they are because of what's happened since 2008. Lovely graph from the TUC, comparing the current recession, depression, with every other one we've ever me measured. Uh, we're the green line, the little dots are not happening because of inflation, we're not getting out of it. For economic nerds, the key question is, 
how likely now is it that we will beat the Napoleonic War depression when wages fell for 24 years compared to what they were at for the average worker in 1798. Right? Exceptional country, exceptional times. What does it mean for people? Uh, this is the average incomes after tax and benefits and housing costs of seven typical children in the country. I'll be able to update this at the end of March when we get our first decent figures since before the pandemic. The pandemic really screws up your family resource survey. Uh, but I don't think they'll change that much. This is what inequality looks like in terms of what people have to live off, how much they have to spend on their children a day. Food, clothes, soap, toothpaste. For two-thirds of kids' holidays, not for one-third, actually, it's nearer 40% now. Never have a holiday. Never have a holiday. Three, with cost of living crisis, four children out of seven, I think, are now living in poverty. We're heading towards a majority. We are weird, and other countries are less weird. This is the inequality index, a genie one. I can tell you about loads later. And there we are, the blue line. You have, apart from Bulgaria, all the countries in the OECD that are more unequal to us are not in Europe. Italy is the country most similar to us, but not that similar at all. And Spain, France and Germany are now next to each other by inequality. And only six countries separate France and Germany from Finland. Right. The Finnish, the Nordic model is winning in the most powerful countries in Europe. Uh, because I was asked to talk about benefits, a very long table, but the only important thing is that you have to go right down to the bottom to find what our benefit levels are for single adults, the lowest. You can't live off job seekers allowance, single support, universal credit as a single adult. It's two times, two and a half times less than what we expect our pensioners to live off at the most. But our pensioners aren't doing that well either. They got the triple lock, two point. 5% increases or inflation or earnings, whichever is the greater after 210. But they had other benefits taken away, which means your average pensioner is only a couple of pounds, less than a couple of pounds better off a day than they were in 2010. Nobody has won out. Another graph on exceptionalism. This is a graph produced by the European Union when we were still in it. It's showing geographical inequalities in each country between the regions. We are the widest bar. The key thing to spot is that the EU had to break the vertical scale to be able to fit us on. The differences between West London and the northeast of England are so incredibly wide it won't fit on. The other key thing to note is that you can't work out what the second most unequal country geographically is in the EU because the second widest bars are also similar. Germany levelled up. Germany was the only other country which had geographical inequalities like we did just after the Berlin Wall fell and they levelled up. Tiny bit on London and I'll bring this to a close. I just put this up mainly to show the Telegraph uh, newspaper getting things wrong. It says West London is more spacious, but most of the uh, darker shaded areas there aren't to the west. You know, I'm a geographer, so this is my skill. Um, but every census, we get a count of bedrooms. The number of bedrooms goes up and up that are empty. People build them, extensions, all kinds of things. We've got more empty bedrooms than ever. This is a map of where people have two or more empty bedrooms in London. They're there. They're available. Um, if you're thinking, what on earth can we do? We can't possibly replicate the building uh, programme in the 1930s. Well, you don't need to replicate the building programme of the 1930s. Here's the opposite. Bring us nearer to here. We're just above the top of that map. The dark blue little areas here are where, on average, people have two fewer bedrooms than they need. 
that's kids sharing with somebody the opposite sex while they are going through puberty and they may not even be related to the other person that they're sharing with. And these maps, I don't have to make them anymore. I mean, that's do a wonderful job of allowing people to make them. If you wanted to know exactly where that area with the highest number of people sharing is, it's this little part of South London. And there's a nice little Twitter exchange between a couple of people who spotted it, going, oh, it looks rather nice to me. Can it really be the most? And of course, behind the posh frontage and the doors, You've got the corridors and the bedsits. You've got the three families living in a, in a flat that was designed for one family and so on. So we can show you woe after woe after, after woe. But the great thing about inequality is that the resources, in this case bedrooms, are there. It's just that they're empty and not being used by the people who need the bedrooms. Gentrification, somebody else's map, 2021 census. Uh, compared to 2011, those red areas, that's the kind of snapshot of the front line of gentrification as it moves east across London. Apologies for the speed of this, but you get an idea. What's really interesting are the blue areas, which are kind of the sinking down, the going down that's happening. Right? The whole country is going down at the moment. We obsess about gentrification and Battersea Power Station, if you read your London Review of Books and so on. But we are sinking. We are, we are sinking. What did the last government do? They increased the level of spending, say on state schools, to keep the gap between the private and the state schools exactly the same as it had been when they entered power in 1997 as when they left in 2010. The Conservatives come in and of course actually cut state school spending, so you get the widening. But the point of showing this graph from the Times and the IFS is that those two lines were going next to each other before. That is no change at all. In fact, it's actually a widening of the gap because the absolute amount of money per kid widened. Life expectancy, these are the ONS forecasts for it and what actually happened. And you see it going down and down and down and down. Only us in the USA had a fall in life expectancy between 2014 and 2018. I spent most of the years between 2012 and 2019 arguing that austerity was killing people. I don't have to do it anymore. The Financial Times now does it. Nobody says it, is, it isn't happening. Things are changing. There's a graph from the FT. Or is it the Guardian? The Guardian. Austerity killed more people than COVID has yet. And because austerity continues, COVID carries on killing, but COVID isn't going to catch up with austerity. Right. Oh, cheer you up, and I must speed on. Uh, you remember David Cameron introducing his happiness index? Yeah? He made ONS, they had to do it. Well, this is it. And um, you've got to remember, 2008, 9 the crash was bad news. Wages went down, people became unhappy. And you can see the happiness, things are worthwhile in life, life satisfaction, happiness going up. You may think, oh, why was it going up then? Think back to... 2, 12, 14, particularly think about 2015 in your sales, 2016. Why were people like you getting happier in 2016? Much happier in 2017. Why were you getting happier? You were. You might not believe it because you're on the left and the left had to be a miserable bunch. <laughs> but on average, you were. You were, getting, you, were, you were pretty happy in 2018. Something happened, though, in 2019 that absolutely devastated you. Not just you, this is the entire country. Look at them shooting down. It was December 2019 in particular. The ex <laughs> I, and the grey part is, is the pandemic. Something happened just before the pandemic which was so terrible that the British people in Cameron's Happiness Index told how awful they felt about what was going on. And it didn't just affect, it affects all the scales. This is anxiety, right? Anxiety was going down, right? Low point, 2015, 2016, 2017, thanks to Madeline and other people, you know, there was some hope. There really was. It shows up in the national stats. It wasn't just you that thought something might change, right? And these were the years of the Brexit debate. And then levels of anxiety absolutely go through the roof in 2019. Uh, and only rise slightly with the worst pandemic we've had since 1918. You know, that's how bad it was. Um, 
The BBC find things hard because we're such an unequal country. Uh, but my favourite BBC headline was this 2019 one. Both of the two main parties have suffered significant losses in a local election. Uh, and this is the graphic where they didn't show uh, with, with, with what they are. So it'll be interesting to see how the BBC report the local elections this spring. This is what didn't happen under Liz Truss. This was what was supposed to happen. This is the IPPR graph of what Quasi's budget would have done, who would have given money to, and this is what the thing about the left-wing economic establishment, that point I was making. It was the international money markets. It was the stock traders who said you just cannot do this. It was the people running the pension funds who said this is madness. Right? There is something changing, and it changed before in the 1920s and 30s. Right? And we often forget that about how it wasn't just people on the left who changed their opinions in the past, it was the entire political establishment that moved. We've got a long way to move. I'm loving the FT at the moment, particularly John Byrne Murdoch. Um, serious scholarly work by thousands of political scientists produced this graph. Of all the political parties in all the high income and middle income countries of the world, each circle is a political party. They're all scaled from who's most left and who's mo most right in the entire world. You've got the Greek Communist Party nearest to me, the Cuban Communists and so on, the link. And the Conservatives used to be just placed with alternative for Deutschland, who they joined in with in 2014 when they left the European Conservatives. But they jumped, they jumped to there. I, I really get annoyed when people tell me not to call our country exceptional and different. It, it really, really is. Wealth and the very rich, of course, they take an enormous and, and ethically undefendable amount of money, but look how the richest 1,000 families got a hit in the pandemic in 2020, and then the Sunday Times stopped reporting the wealth of most of them and only reports on the richest 250 now. Right? Things are switching. Chief executive officers, not yet. If you want another Twitter thing to follow, Max 12 to 1, on their campaign to get CEOs not to take more than 12 times their workers. Um, but things are, are switching. Last, we've got two more slides and then I'll end. This one has too much writing, but of course it is awful. The statistics don't really hit home. And the problem is that you get numbed to each new fact. The one that numbed me most recently in my hometown, which is Oxford, are the stories of babies now being washed in cold water because people can't put the boilers on to wash their babies. And we can't work out if babies were washed in cold water in Oxford in the 1920s or 30s. But we suspect they weren't. So that's the liturgy of what is getting worse and worse and worse. Final graph, Sunday Times, I think. We've got no idea what's going to happen this year. Benefits and state pension have gone up by the official rate of inflation, which is 6% 6, 6 less than the inflation that poor people suffer. Most of the pay claims that I've seen going through have been progressive. That is, you are offered higher pay for lower paid workers, a deal which is a long way below inflation for your average worker in your union and less for the higher paid. We're having progressive pay, pay claims being won or being offered to try to break strikes. I'm still waiting for the university vice chancellors who realise that if they were simply to offer to cap their own pay at 12 to 1, which is an enormous amount of money, but forever onwards in future, and maybe bring it down, the ratio, they might be able to get somewhere where their negotiations with the employers. We may be becoming more equal in terms of income right now and in terms of wealth, because house prices have fallen for four months and pensions are dodgy, Final plug, it won't come out until August or September, but of course I'm writing about it. It was slightly tricky to write about when I began over a, a year, year and a half ago. Um, 
became far, far too easy to write about how this is now a shattered nation in all kinds of ways. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thanks, Tammy. Our next presenter is Professor Imogen Tyler from Lancaster University. She's a professor of sociology up at Lancaster. She's a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences and a social activist. Her research focuses on social inequalities of poverty, social class, and race. And her books, The Sociology of Stigma, and the latest one, Stigma, the Machinery of Inequality. She's a trustee of the Poverty Truth Network, executive board member of Lancaster Black History Group, and also a member of the Joseph Roundtree Plus Roundtree Foundation Stigma and Poverty Design Team. Thanks, <coughs> Jim, for this. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, thanks, Danny. In a way, Danny's beautifully set up what I'm going to do, which is the qualitative side of sociology, and talk to you about some of the stories. I'm going to focus on poverty, some of the stories. I'm going to leap straight in, and then it'll become clearer uh, after that what I'm going to do with you. So, I want to take you back to 2018, when I was at the launch event of the Morecambe Bay Poverty Truth Commission in Lancaster, which is in the northwest of England. Poverty Truth Movement brings together people living in poverty in local communities with local decision makers or people with power, as they're sometimes called, to try and find ways to tackle poverty locally. And at this launch event, which is a really powerful event where people were testifying on their own experience, David, a young man in his early 20s, told his story. And I want to share just a little bit of his testimony uh, with you. I was one of nine kids. My mum felt forced to drug deal. It was the only way she could feed us. The stress on her, not knowing where the next meal was coming from, it all rubbed off on us kids. Kids absorb things like that. It's really hard living like that. The only thing that held us together was the community, the people on our estate. Everyone would chip in to buy food for a month for people like us who didn't have enough. Nana was at the heart of the estate. She took all the kids out, taking us on minibuses for days out, out of her own pocket at first. So we had something to do because we had nothing and parents could have one day without worrying about feeding their kids. My voice gets shaky when I read some of this because it's really powerful testimony. She started running the community centre. The place was heaving with kids all the time. It was a tiny hut in the car park of our school. Everything happened there. It was all we had, all anyone had. It was magical, a place of no worries. And there was meals there too, that was important. If it wasn't for my nan and all she did for me and all the other kids, I would have killed myself. Oh. Ten years ago, the youth workers from the council came and did a project, a massive music gig with all the lads and girls from the local council estates, and it was amazing. All us kids from the same background, all in poverty, and without that project, we would have ended up scrapping and gang wars because it was the only way we had of releasing all the anger that we had. The project brought everyone together. It's the best thing I've ever done. It was amazing, and everyone said that. Then the funding was taken away, and we were left with nothing. You're so afraid of what will happen to you. If you, oh, Our school was good. I had no bullying there. The kids had serious difficulties at the school, a lot of the kids. ADHD, Asperger's, you weren't judged. They treated you like family. They got to know your parents. They went to appointments with you. You felt accepted there. They, you, have shut that down now to our school. Then you've got nowhere to go and nothing to do and you get bullied. Young kids, age 13, 15, the main drug dealers get you to sell heroin and crack. You're so afraid of what will happen to you if you don't do it. And there's nothing else. It's all the youth stuff hadn't been taken away. We wouldn't have been pulled to the streets to these men. I hold the politicians who made these decisions responsible for what happened to me. They don't understand what they destroy by taking those activities away. It was the only freedom that we had, and it was taken away. We were just a number to them.
when you're in poverty, you end up with nothing because it's all taken away and no one cares. Everything goes from worse to worse. My family gets evicted. We move to another area where we don't know anyone. And your property needs work doing. The landlord won't do it. It's condemned. You're moved on. Same thing happened. Condemned, moved on. It doesn't matter if my mum had to live in her mate's one bed flat and sleep on the floor. No one cares. The government believes in money more than human beings and all they do is take, take, take. I became street homeless, but I was not a priority because by this time I was 24. So the council told me I wasn't a priority. You have no hope. It feels like the government are trying to make a superior race. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. If I had one thing to say to the government, it would be treat me as you want to be treated. See me as a person, not a number. Sorry, it always upsets me this because I know the person. <laughs> Go back to... So this is powerful. What I found particularly powerful about this is that David grew up literally in that decade of austerity and he saw the strangulation of all of those lifelines, those support mechanisms and practices of care which made his childhood livable the closure of the magical local community centre, the evisceration of youth and outreach services, the shutting down of his inclusive local school because it was assessed as underperforming in academic league tables, the eviction of his family, the snuffing out of these lifelines made him vulnerable to predatory men, his own eventual addiction issues and homelessness. His testimony is also an accusation. Dave is directly addressing those with power, seated in front of him in the town hall, trying to say, you are accountable, asking them to take responsibility for his abandonment. Fast forward, November 2022, and a senior coroner's report into the avoidable death of two-year-old Awab Ishak in December 2020 from respiratory failure and heart failure caused by the deadly mould in the uninhabitable flat in which he and his family were forced to live. His parents described the to toddler's coughing fits uh, when they, they were interviewed after the, made a statement after the coroner's hearing, and they described how they'd done everything they could. They'd screamed and shouted. They begged health professionals, housing staff, to try and sort out those conditions. They were refugees, Awab's parents are refugees from Sudan, and they accused the Housing Association of racism. We have no doubt, they said, we were treated in this way because we're not from, we were not from this country. And one of the many shameful aspects of this case was an initial attempt by the Housing Association to stigmatise and shift blame onto the family by claiming the mould was caused by their lifestyle. The Housing Association has received 106 complaints, just that one Housing Association, about excessive mould and damp in the 12 months since our web's death. As a tenant on the state put it, we are facing death by a thousand cuts, as profits are put before people. When she delivered a verdict, the senior coroner said, I'm not um, alone, Joanna Kersley in having thought, how does this happen? We can see, actually, from Danny's graphs how it's happening, yeah? How in the UK does this happen to a two-year-old child uh, dying from exposure to mould in their home? So I'm a sociologist. I work on inequalities, primarily of poverty, uh, but also racism, misogyny, and as I intersect also with citizenship, migration. And for about 10 years, I've been working with anti-poverty groups and organisations, including refugee groups, gypsy traveller groups, local anti-poverty groups and national organisations. And I'm currently working with the National Poverty Truth Commission Network and Joseph Rowntree Foundation. And we know... I was going to tell you some of the data on poverty, but I don't think I need to, because I think Danny has really covered that for us. But I think it's really important, as a northerner here, to, to, to emphasise some of those geographical inequalities in terms of poverty and you know, the absence of a, any real levelling up at all. 
um, the deeply uneven poverty also in terms of black and ethnic minority households, um, you know, unbelievably overrepresented. Certain particular groups are in that data, and JF have got great data on that. Disabled people. So we need to move away from just thinking about working people or workers here. Definitions of work too need challenging, and think about those people who are really, you know, maybe unable to work for different reasons because they've got caring responsibilities. Single parent households are really massively overrepresented, and of course, kids who I've begun with, uh, and those clustering at that cl clustering of poverty in particular areas. And I think we've wasted decades on technocratic arguments about how poverty should be measured. And we need to stop also framing people in poverty as the problem and begin to articulate poverty as an issue of economic injustice and as an outcome of designed inequalities. Concealed behind the statistics are millions of individual stories of anger, and as you can hear, I've got some of my own when I read this material, misery, shame and wasted human potential. But so often, the voices, experience, agency, and the expertise of people who are living in poverty are absent from political and policy debates. And what I think, in terms of thinking about progressive policy and moving forward, is that we have to understand properly how we got here. And this is a question of language, question of framing, and a question of like how we shift the dial on the sorts of data that Danny's told us, the extreme situation we have in the UK in terms of inequality. So I asked uh, my friend Andy Knox, who's a GP in North Lancashire and a director of population health for Morecambe Bay. I asked him, how do we get here, Andy? And he said that we've developed some kind of narrative around poverty that most people are poor because they're lazy or feckless or wasters or they've done something wrong somehow. And yet you hear story after story after story of people who've experienced major social injustice and actually don't have this sense of any great choice available to them. And they're coming to you and saying, what can I do? And increasingly in response, saying, you're saying to them, I don't actually know. I'm going to come back to the impact of that on frontline workers. Not being able to help is actually also incredibly impoverishing for us as a society. So I'm really interested in thinking about consent. Where consent came from for austerity in the first place? Because I think if we don't understand that, we're not going to be able to move past and create the other kind of language that we need to. How do we shift the dial on that deserving, undeserving frame? Now, I've written about this at great length, this period of austerity, so you can read that. I'm not going to rehearse that here, except to say that, and, and these are quotes from um, an Osborne speech from 2008 that was prefigured the election, where he laid out what was going to come in that, uh, what, what, what ended up being a coalition government with the implementation of austerity. But what's really important to understand is that that undeserving framing was baked into the design of austerity. It's what I call a stigma politics. Stigma politics and neoliberal economic politics and policies work hand in hand. We could think of it almost as a stigmonomics, that, that neoliberalism is, relies politically, economically, culturally, socially, on stigma production from above. And I'm not going to rehearse this period in too much length because I've written about it a lot before and you can go and read it. Except to say that the architects of austerity knew that effective stigma craft would be critical to winning public consent. Um, and what they created was effectively a right-wing culture war where, um, that Cameron launched you know, by declaring a war on welfare culture, as he called it, in uh, 2011. So in order to implement austerity, you've got to make the public feel that those in receipt of welfare, but now welfare is contracted, it's reframed to mean people who are receiving cash benefits, 
Not all of those services we all rely on, health, education, etc. So the contraction of welfare, it's reframing as part of this stigma politics. We had several years of this propaganda campaign where the menace of benefits cheats and welfare dependency was maintained as rolling news by politicians, think tanks, journalists. This is an orchestrated moral panic, tutoring the public to believe that people living in poverty are feckless, deprivation is a consequence of poor choices. And these stigma feedback loops emerged, and me and uh, one of my colleagues tracked this with the uh, Welfare Reform Act going through Parliament, in which characters in reality TV programmes that are highly scripted, they're sensationalised, they're exploitative, they're not real, despite being reality. These stigma feedback loops and these characters then become captured as evidence in support of austerity reforms in Parliament. So if you go through Hansard, you can see how these figures, these characters from television, get recirculated as evidence for the need for welfare reforms. And of course, across newspapers, columns, think tanks, etc. I call this the welfare stigma machine. It churns through society, settling in institutional forms, embedding in the design also of social policies, but also infecting the culture, practices and attitudes of those working in the front line of services. This stigma optics change the way in which the public also made evaluative judgments about hardship. And it changed how people related to each other, eroding structures of care and corroding passion. It also changed the way in which people thought about themselves. So this is a single mum uh, that I've worked with uh, through Poverty Truth, um, who I write about quite a bit in the book. And she talked a lot to me about feeling ashamed, but she also really theorised, and theory just comes out of universities. It comes from ordinary people, from grassroots. And she really theorised the relationship between the stuff, you know, this period, what was happening all around her, how this was feeding culture and how, she, how it affected her mental health and her, her well-being in a kind of, in a really direct way, how she felt needled with this stigma around uh, welfare and benefits and how it seeped incessantly into her world, leading her to become actually quite uh, un unwell. But it was at every scale that she experienced it in all her uh, interactions with the state. So governing welfare through stigma is not a new phenomena. Actually, it's about, in Britain, it's about 500 years old to cultivate stigma, you know, in order to ration relief uh, and govern the poor has obviously been around for a long time. But there's, um, some sociologists have argued that there's something particular about British class society, and we can kind of almost see that exceptionalism in Danny's uh, graphs, that, that Britain is somehow particularly attached to stigma ideologies, perhaps because of its uh, history as a, as a very class-differentiated society. And even the 20th century welfare state... You know, many elements of stigma were deliberately retained and designed into our welfare systems. So in the context of the global rise of neoliberal orthodoxy, you know, and this is US pundits here, openly calling for the intensification of welfare stigma. So you get this kind of yo-yo historically where there's less stigma, stigma sort of designed out, or policies are trying to be less stigmatising to make people you know, access services to get away barriers for people seeking help, and then you get more stigma being produced culturally, put into policies, etc. But here, definitely in this period, um, in the noughties, we get this call, this right-wing call, to cultivate stigma as good policy, to intensify welfare stigma. And as we saw, that happened in the UK, 
and you know, particularly we saw it in culture as well as in politics and policy. The figure of the hard-working family or the ta hard-working taxpayer who begins to be pitted against the welfare scrounger and also the um, undeserving migrant. Danny has already covered that, so I'm not going to pause here, except to say what we see here is the termination not only of, of cuts to services and the sorts of poverty that are consequent of that, but the termination of the promise, I think, of the welfare state and the impact of that, that promise not being there, the promise of social mobility, the promise of greater equality, of health, education, wealth and opportunity. What does the termination of that promise feel like for young children growing up under austerity and now today? All the anti-poverty activists and people I've worked with, uh, organisations, groups and JRF are putting money into stigma and poverty for this reason at the moment. That all they tell me that the stigma and shame of poverty can be as devastating as the material want that goes with it. They're kind of symbiotic stigma poverty in, in lots of different ways. Stigma is dehumanising. The power of stigma is that it enables people to be seen as and treated as less deserving, less human than others. So it's the stigma politics that allows children like Awab to perish in conditions unfit for human habitation and abandons young people like David to the streets. And I can talk more about my stigma machine in the questions if there's time. For kids who are growing up in this hostile environment, poverty stigma undermine, has undermined their sense of self-worth. Steve, a youth worker in Hull that I'm working with at the moment, tells me how shame and stigma has battered down many of the young people he works with. They don't see a way out, and they, he describes a kind of acquiescence and a sense of no future. Um, and he works for kids doing rap, uh, music, graffiti, creative practices that enables kids to communicate their kind of experiences. They've, they've kind of shut down or enclosed uh, within themselves. Nazrat, uh, a community researcher in Tower Hamlets that I'm lucky enough to be working with at the moment as well, she describes, and I think this is brilliant because it kind of sums up, I think, what poverty stigma is. Poverty stigma is coercive control, she tells me. Um, and there's so much packed in there that uh, we can unpack, but I haven't got time now. Andy, the GP I introduced earlier, described to me the impact of this deepening poverty on his practice. So the impact of poverty is political, as I hope we all know, and the impact of poverty is on the whole of society, including on health and other frontline workers, as I'm sure some of you here today know. And he describes people coming into his practice saying, my life is terrible and I don't know what to do about it, and how the physical and mental health stresses people are experiencing are actually directly related to poverty, to a lack of ability to participate in life, and have positive choices available to them. It's really harrowing as a clinician or GP who really loves your community because you feel helpless. You're sitting, listening, and you're holding someone's pain with them, but you can't fix it. And, you know, suicide, female GPs have the highest occupational suicide rate in the UK, which I think tells us something about the stresses and how now they're caught up, GPs, on the front line of this stigma politics, yeah? The harassing, the haranguing of GPs that we see going on on social media and in the press and, and in Parliament. You know, the, these are people who've given their lives to caring for others, but a lot of what they're seeing, they can't cure, they can't do anything about. Imagine how that makes them feel as professionals. So, solutions. John Hills, late John Hills, argued 
that successive governments have deliberately contracted the meaning of welfare, which I mentioned earlier. They reframe welfare as an unaffordable system of cash benefits doled out to economically inactive people. So if you talk to people on the street in day-to-day -day context, when you say the welf word welfare, it's like the word welfare itself has become stigmatised through this process, yeah? And welfare immediately conjures up these images of particular groups of, of people. I think, you know, to achieve wealth sharing and tax justice, to achieve economic justice and a new social, social settlement, we have to take this challenge of language and framing really seriously in changing the dial and contesting this kind of anti-welfare common sense. Hal uh, Carnham, who is in the audience uh, today, hello Hal, is also working with me on the JRF work around stigma and poverty. And she says we need to design stigma out uh, of our services. So finally, and I won't speak to this because I will have run out of time, but I guess what I'm saying we need to work towards in any new social settlement is a destigmatized welfare state. That includes shouting loudly about which, which I've tried to do today about the poverty emergency that we currently have, raising awareness of stigma politics, I call it, and its impacts, including, I think, putting poverty and class discrimination into legal equality frameworks, creating attitudinal change. This is the hardest bit, in a way. Media, strategic communication, where poverty becomes to be understood as everybody's problem, and in, in intersexual way, intersectional ways, involve people with lived experience in the design of services and policies, disinvest from things that don't work. We don't want a paternalistic welfare state. You know, not everything was great or worked about it. We're missing it, uh, where it's disappeared. But we need, to, we need to create a new kind of welfare state and involve people with lived experience, deep listening to them about actually what they want and need, I think we need to reclaim the idea, the more utopian idea and ideals of cradle-to-grave welfare, build trust and accountability, distribute wealth, renew democracy, turn the dial on migration. Not just because we were here and they were there, because migration is a positive social and economic good. Turn the dial on migration. How? I don't know support international human rights frameworks, allow asylum seekers and those in immigration processes to work and access welfare the same as others. Thank you very much. There's a hell of a lot there, so we'll have a few interventions now if people are indicated. Sorry, Richard, do you want to come in first? Just if people can introduce themselves, two minutes. Yeah. To get your okay. point Thank, thanks, John. Richard Reza, I coordinate UK Disability History Month, and Danny, I was a social geographer, so it helps. Um, it's a question to you, really. Those maps and the graphs are very powerful, but do they really change things? An example from history and the map of um, occupancy. It looked extremely like Charles Booth's maps in, in, in the, uh, of London, which led to the first welfare state, the Liberal government bringing in the pension, was because of those maps. So they did have a big impact there. But do people take any notice of them now? Or is it what Imogen had said, that the ideology and the values have been so undermined that there isn't a basis for people to respond to that? The second thing is on... Uh, from the point of view of disabled people, which I think need to be part of this and can be an organised group, uh, cutting edge, and have been, with, if we look at uh, disabled people against the cuts, have maintained opposition to what's been going on, to the 45 uh, cuts that the, this government has introduced to disabled people's living. And actually the majority of those, of those 335,000 were disabled people. If you actually look in detail at it, they think about 60%. So with the people who've died because of uh, benefit uh, reductions and the 
disproportionate number of people who died through COVID for lack of care uh, from the state. About half a million disabled people have died during uh, the austerity measures. That's more than were killed officially in Nazi Germany in the, in the 30s and 40s and is an attempt at eugenics, I, I would argue, to actually demonize us and to kill us off. And the fact that we now have a, a vice chair of the Tory party who's happy to start killing people again, do you both think there is now a danger of eugenicist murder plan to kill off the, the, those people? That's where stigma leads, to, isn't it? Stigma leads to organized state death. So this is a very serious issue. And the last point I would make is unfortunately, austerity didn't start with George Osborne. At the time George Os Osborne was saying that, it was New Labour that started to attack the Disabled People's Living Allowance, and I was on the National Advisory Panel where that was argued. And that had happened before in 2004 when they wanted to cut our benefits. We need to get a commitment deep in any manifesto to maintaining the rights of disabled people because, they were, if you like, we are the canary in the mine, and if we're going, then so are going to be single mums and other people, pensioners and so on. So I think this is really important. Thank you. Richard. Two minutes each and we'll be... Uh, very, very brief. I think we should stop using the word we because we is us and them. Putting it very crudely, there's b a better way of saying it than that. But the notion that we have done nothing, that we have not been resisting and fighting back, which is why we are here for a very long time. I do think we should think about the sort of hegemonic vocabulary what? that's being used around whoever it is that is in this country and in Europe. We, let's not say we, please everybody, Let's say who we are, who they are, and who everybody is. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Woman behind, and then we'll come to this guy in the middle here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Naira. I was a Labour councillor here in Camden uh, until uh, last election. And one question for Danny. Um, thank you for the powerful presentation. You keep repeating the idea that something is changing. So I would like to hear from you a little bit more on that and if you think that Labour could uh, make better use of this opportunity to, to make bolder proposals. Thank you. Good. There's a guy in the middle here. Back. The young man, that's it. They just go along there. Hi, uh, my name is Cyrus. I'm a occupational therapy assistant in the NHS. Uh, my question was um, to... Everyone, and again, thank you. It was really interesting hearing people speak about really important things. Um, just how to, I think I see really important parallels between what is happening with stigma in terms of people who are receiving state welfare and people who are being stigmatized um, in terms of the migrant communities. And I think just yesterday seeing horrible scenes in Knowlesley and um, people who, I mean, live in... I think the second most deprived area in the UK, just sort of coming out and, um, I mean, essentially I mean, protesting against another very deprived group of people as asylum seekers who were living in a hotel. I mean, you see such a narrative now about um, asylum, asylum seekers and they're all living in hotels, I mean, living it up in some sense, but um, just how do you marry those two groups of deprived people together and fight for something progressive, people that are deprived and also need help and don't need to be stigmatized and materially should, I suppose, be on our side, people that maybe don't have very much, with people who are, again, just another deprived group, but then at the moment, I mean, the first group is out and burning police cars to get out of the second group. Okay. Can you pass it to the woman next to you? Thank you. Hi, I'm Jane. I'm a councillor in Newcastle. So I have a, a challenge and a question for everybody here, really, which is get involved in local government. 
Local government has been at the front line of cuts and often obviously when it gets it wrong, sometimes because we're not in a position to be able to provide the services we should, sometimes because the people, even when it's a Labour Council, are not taking the progressive approach that they should. And I want more people to get involved in local government and to think that is where you can be on the fr front line fighting now. And if you don't think it matters, ask yourself why the Tories are so keen to impose mayoral models and why the right of the Labour Party is so reluctant to have left-wing people involved in being councillors. The other comment I would make on stigma, which is a bit of a challenge for all of us on the left, is that even at its best, that paternalist welfare state has created a lot of welfare state professionals which on one, I teach maths to kids who've been excluded from schools. We have to accept that sometimes we've gone along with helping people rather than empowering them. Yeah. And one side helps, the other, heart, the other takes away. It's all about them being recipients of either kindness or cruelty. And that's not the way we should be living. Thank you. Okay. I'll, go take, I'll take a couple more. Don't worry, after the next session, I'll bring other people in as well, okay? We've got these two people here on this side. I'm trying to do a gen gender and geographical split here. It's impossible. Um, it's a question for uh, Dr. Mary. Um, I run a local family business with my dad, and we're looking to become a cooperative. But the question uh, that had, a, and I agreed with everything you said, but then what was the, the next step in the plan in terms of moving capital away from where it is now into businesses that do want to uh, democratically empower people what, what was that missing link between sort of your plans and then obviously taking the action? Because we, we've tried to raise finance, for example, from a Big Issue Invest. They said they had 450 applications, but they can only fund 10. So if there's people out there that want to do it, what is the sort of help and plan to do so? Oh, okay. Can I just sit in front here? Hi, my name is Marco, and I'm uh, growing a grassroots media network called Open Protest Network um, for and by grassroots organizations. Um, I just wanted to share a quick anecdote. There's, I can see there's some familiar faces. I was at the People's Assembly uh, conference a few weeks ago, and it was really striking. There was one moment um, during the conference where they were debating a motion, and um, it was around the, the wording of, of the motion to do with uh, working class and who was included in that uh, name. And it really struck me, it was quite toxic um, because it, the, the person who brought up the problem was like, oh, working class doesn't really involve other people who are disaffected uh, and, and oppressed in, in lots of other ways. And, and, and someone else stood up quite fervently and and exclaimed like shouted you know it's in the name working class read it and and it, it it's one of those things where i just got like a bit of whiplash is thinking like are you serious like there's a whole room of us talking about you know solidarity uh, and unity and and here you are just building a massive wall and cutting a bunch of people out for what you know um and I really like this this slide you have here, and and, you, and how you you accentuated the point about um, um, create create uh, attitudinal change, media and strategic communication. That's you know first and foremost what I'm trying to help develop is is this strategy. We all everyone seems to be in their own bubble still, even in this room. Sorry to say, I mean, I, I don't want to sound cynical or or or, or whatever, but. You know, feelings matter more than facts in this day and age, unfortunately. Brexit is winning on feelings still. I mean, even if it's losing, it's still winning on, on that. Uh, there's one thing to hear a Tory councillor saying um, poverty is a choice, because I hear that. I'm sorry, uh, some people hear that as well. Um, but we need to, to get real with, with the situation where... That, their side, they're all convening for strategies on, on media and comms. And wh what I would say is poetry, because uh, as was mentioned before, um, during the Nazi regime, lots of people were murdered by the state. Um, and, and the only way you can do that, the only way you can get normal people, because they did psych evaluations on, on the people who committed these, these terrors, they were relatively normal people. You couldn't distinguish them. 
the only way you do that is through good poetry, through strong poetry. And if we don't have our alternative for that, concerted efforts through, you know, again, uh, uh, as an anarchist, I feel kind of dirty saying this, but we need some kind of world building, some kind of, you know, overall strategy that we can all unify behind and work towards. Thanks. Lots of people have indicated. There's a guy who is very patiently has had his hand up down here. If I can just bring him in, and then I'll get the panel to respond in a limited period of time, and then we'll go on to the next session. This is going to be hard work today, um, but it's worth it, I think. Yeah. Simon Forbes, PCS activist and so I suppose doctoral. Um, just a question which is relevant to all the panel, but particularly to Mary's uh, presentation, is manifestos are very short-term documents. I mean, is there not some need for a strategic program? In, back in 1982, Labour, I expect John remembers, the Labour Party did have a proper program, a strategic program. Um, a, a program uh, and, and preceding documents like alternative economic strategy. I'm not saying we should carbon, uh, re carbon copies of, of these old documents, but uh, the, the principle of an uh, and, of, uh, alternative economic and political strategy aiming at fundamental and qualitative change in the economy, society and state and, um, and it will help to producing such constructive uh, documents will, will uh, help uh, combat the suggestion by our dear friend Keir Starmer that um, it, um, we are just interested in being a party of pro turning the Labour Party a party of protest and not a, a party of government and there is no alternative to his own agenda such as it is. Thanks a lot. Right, God, there's a hell of a lot of questions there. If you can try and respond to some, that would be really helpful, okay? Danny, do you want to kick off? Yeah, I'll have a go first. Um, Richard, thanks for mentioning Charles Booth's maths. Uh, Charles Booth was the son of a very rich shipping owner from Liverpool. So rich he could pay hundreds of women, mainly women, to collect data across London to try and win a bet that there was very little poverty in London. And he lost the bet. Oh. Push it. There we go. Charles lost the bet. Uh, that there was, there was little poverty in London when he employed hundreds of women to collect data, which is where you get the booth maps from, and you get that huge change that took decades um, from the 1880s, 1890s, through to the turning point, inequality peaked in 1918, and then fell and fell and fell. Uh, so these things matter. In the last six weeks, I've seen more maps of poverty than I've seen in all of my life. And I've seen more maps of poverty in the last six weeks because ONS have just made it possible for anybody to create Charles Booth types maps of deprivation from the census. And I could spend half an hour showing you publicly created map after map on social media of social cleansing in various northern cities of people doing that. So I think it, I think it will be some help. Um, eugenics. There's other things going on. Um, Directly from COVID, we lost 10% of all our women aged over 90 died of COVID. We lost 15% of all men over 90. And then most of the rest were between 80 and 89. And then it goes down. And of course, a lot of those were disabled. But they were over 90. Now, remember your basic inequality stats. We have a 10, 20 year life expectancy gap in this class between, in this country between social classes. The majority of people who died in the pandemic were relatively well off and very old, right? They were killing their own voters by mismanagement. Uh, and it, this is rarely recognized because when you adjust for age, it's the poor. But if you don't adjust for age, uh, that's why we had the glut of detached houses on the market and the housing boom, uh, because of who died. You can't have a rush to the countryside and the suburbs without a sudden availability of housing. Um, so there is an indiscriminateness about this, and austerity as well before it. It was lack of social care visits to people who may have voted Conservative all their life, but were living on their own in their late 80s or early 90s and no longer getting that visit once a week because we halved the number of adult uh, social workers. You, when they do eugenics, it's about 
killing off people who are going to have children, um, which, which is different. So uh, the, the councillor from Camden who asked about evidence of something is changing. The last time we got the beginnings of a change, which was 1918, nobody noticed for 20 years. Because when inequalities fall, things tend to be bad for everybody. It's what they used to say about socialism. You know, you're going to make everybody more equal and more miserable. So it's happening under Sunak uh, at, at the moment. The one person who did notice was Hugh Dalton, who was a PhD student at the London School of Economics. He wrote a thesis about inequality. Uh, and he became Chancellor in 1950. Uh, so I can give you various things that say it looks like the last peak, but we won't know for time. But other things, you've talked quite a lot about the North. Somebody very close to me at the weekend bought their lunch at Greg's in Whitney and then felt really guilty because they walked with their Greg's bag past the food bank queue in Whitney, David Cameron's constituency in Oxfordshire, and the queue was so long for the families of old people in Whitney. You, know, you, can, you can feel things changing. The southeast of England, in 2019, swung towards Labour. The Labour vote increased more than the Conservative vote. Oxfordshire and Cambridgeshire now don't have Conservative county councils for the first time ever, I think. Um, there are all kinds of things that are going on and, and changing that you can see. Finally, about facts and feelings. Uh, and I'm going to argue, as you might guess, that you need both. Uh, and it's not just because I do facts and I'm not so good at uh, doing feelings. I hate doing feelings because I get more emotional than Imogen does if I have a go uh, doing it. But on the effects of facts, if you can remember back to a little book called The Spirit Level that was produced in, in 2009, Inequality and poverty were not on the agenda in 2009. They didn't feature in the top eight things where people were asked what they mattered about, what mattered to them. The economy only just pipped immigration because of the biggest crash for ages. Immigration was a big thing. Inequality and poverty now worldwide, according to Ipsos Mori, are, is the second most featured problem when people are polled across the world about what they worry about most. Only 1% of people mention something slightly more than inequality and poverty as their biggest problem, and that's cost of living crisis. Right? The facts that came out from those people who worked on the spirit level and around the world have altered what the public say matter to them. It has to keep on being done, but you can demonstrate it really does have effect. Stories and emotions, Jennifer's ear, all those kind of things are very effective as well. But slowly plugging away at what is essentially true, just as Charles Booth ended up doing for the rest of his life after he found out he was completely and utterly wrong, they have a huge effect in the long term over what happens. Thank you, Jim. Great questions. I, I want to address the question. Um, sorry, I forgot your name. The gentleman who asked around, uh, who mentioned events in Knowsley last night, where we saw right-wing protests outside a hotel where we um, refugees are living. And I suppose you know, there's this. You know, we saw this with Brexit. The ways in which we have to look really carefully at what's going on here. This is what, partly what I try and do. And in my book, I look just as much as at refugees and migrants and nationalism as I do at uh, poverty and, and, and those questions. But really, this is exactly an example of a kind of stigma politics at work here. Yeah? Look who's just been elected as deputy chairman of the Tory party. Look at the language that is coming out of Westminster. Look at the language coming from our uh, Home Secretary. I mean, that, you know, we, we have here decades of racism and xenophobia and anti-migrant politics fueled by our politicians, supported by um, media a lot of the time. You know, this endless... I remember speaking to someone once who was uh, a journalist at The Sun and, you know, talking about how the editor would come in. This is, like, in the early noughties and say, 
right, we need a story about asylum, you know. There was a, there was a total relationship between Westminster politics and, and the kinds of storylines that were being seen. This is stigma politics, as I call it, at work. Now, there was a little tiny bit of an assumption, it's not a criticism of you, but that the, those were people from Knowsley, and I'm sure some of them were, but actually what we find is actually really right-wing organising going on, fascist organising going on, and that some of those people who would have led that protest and incited that violence would not have been from that local area. They've, they've been shipped there. But it's coming from the top down. It's not working class people, you know, who may, some, of them, some may participate in it, but it's, this isn't a class. It's coming from the top and it's incited um, and fermented by culture and the whole political system. This is how stigma politics work. And how it works is to divide groups against each other, as you identified and others have said. And so how do we have to have an anti-stigma politics to work out what to do about those divisions, some of which now you know, are so unbelievably intense in, 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 in our social and cultural life? and lead to real violence on the streets, as we saw last night. But we can see also uh, of other marginal groups being pulled into that. And as I said, even frontline workers, you know, stigmatised as part of this just intensification of this culture of hate speech. So I suppose I want to say that part of the challenge for us is how to do intersectional forms of politics um, that... That, that are counter this division. And that's a challenge that there's not one answer to. It has to be a multi-pronged response. But I think unless we do that, and we can turn the dial on that, you know, we can't have a progress... All the progressive policies in the, in the world won't work unless we address those issues collectively uh, together. Um, so, that, yeah. I think that was, the, that was the one I wanted Thanks, to yeah. answer the most. <coughs> Hello, Jane from Newcastle. I totally agree that isn't the sort of welfare state we want. And my sister all, does work in local government in Newcastle, so <laughs> hello. <laughs> Can I thank Imogen and Danny for the session? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>